Hello, Booktube. Well, as you can see, I'm not at Hyde Cottage still. <laughs> I'm still up at the old house in Vermont. I think that Frida and I had originally planned sketchily uh, to stay for a week. And when that time came to an end, Boston got hit with a massive snowstorm, one of the largest snowstorms in its recorded meteorological history. <laughs> it didn't hit Vermont nearly as bad, but it would have meant somebody driving into the teeth of that. And it would have meant me going back to a hide cottage that's buried, that's unshoveled, that might have no power. So we just stayed. <laughs> we just stayed. We're, we're Labine and I ultimately, maybe not psychically, but certainly physically, we're a very low drain on the system here, especially now that I have uh, the freedom of the kitchen. Now I can make a quick breakfast for myself in the bean. Well, there's hardly any trouble at all. We just we just sit on the couch, just like we do at Hyde Cottage. Um, so we're staying uh, for a little bit longer. <laughs> my my hosts are looking a little older by the day, but I'm having a blast. <laughs> uh, and that has meant uh, that my trip has extended into February, and February is FFS. <laughs> it's February Fantasy Stories, which is an event cooked up by the Bookish Bryants, as a sort of a bookend to their November, the, the, event, the event they did in November that we all love so much, uh, New World's November. It was a terrific event where we examined the world of science fiction through the lens of shorter works, less than 250 pages, and with a few guiding prompts or categories, if you want. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot more fun than I thought it would be, and uh, I was happy to be invited to be a host for FFS. <laughs> and uh, there are a lot of other uh, there are a lot of uh, permutations of this particular approach. You could do this for literature. You could even do this for history. You could certainly do it for horror or westerns. Uh, <laughs> for the month of February, we are doing the, the New World's November approach only to fantasy. So fewer than two hundred and fifty pages. Uh, but really, I, myself, as one of the hosts and a sexy influencer, would really like to push you to read short stories. Not novels, not novellas, not anything like that, but short stories. Short stories are, tend to be overlooked, and that's a shame, because short stories for fantasy and science fiction both played a formative role in shaping the genre. So there are a lot of short stories out there that are worth your time and attention. There are even a lot that aren't, that you will still find entertaining to read. Uh, so we're taking that same approach for February. And there are prompts. There, the first week is classic fantasy, which is anything before 1971. Then the second week is sword and sorcery. I'm going off the top of my head here, so I might mix things up. But the second week, I think, is sword and sorcery. Then the third week is dark fantasy or grim dark. Dark fantasy as it began with, you know, the darker stories in Conan or the Cthulhu mythos. Going all the way to the, the you know, the nomenclature of the 21st century where it's grim dark. Uh, and then the final week is uh, urban fantasy, where you've got cities and buses and subways and trams and electricity, but you've also got magic, where they're very much together and playing off each other. Um, and, you know, those aren't binding, as with any good, with any good fun reading event, those aren't binding. But there is, a, there is a, a ton of great hosts for this event, all of whose channels you should check out. I keep forgetting to leave a list of the host channels, but I will do that with this video. Uh, and I am the freak in the pack, of course, as you would expect, because my hosts have lives. They have things to do, and I don't. <laughs> so I like I like elaborating on these things. This was a, this was a, a little twist of a difference that my co-hosts at uh, Book Trek uh, last year learned, <laughs> much to their vexation, is that I... I'm perfectly happy to make a video a day on the thing when they can do one, one a week or one every two weeks. Uh, I think I have the blessing of my FFS co-host to do as many videos as I want. I'm hoping that I do. I want to do another one today, but I'm once again not. Today, I'm once again not going to specific books in a kind of TBR discussion. Instead, yesterday I discussed uh, some hallmarks of classic fantasy, good or bad, for or good or ill. They can be used either way. They can be done well or poorly. And today I want to give you, I guess what you could call a classic fantasy starter kit. But it's also a decalogue. It's also the, the great canon of this particular part of fantasy. So it's with with when I do starter kits on this channel, usually it's places that will, you know, where you can enter in, where you can get your feet in that into a particular subject. Uh, this is partially that, but this is also the 10 books of, of classic fantasy that you absolutely have to read. Uh, <laughs> so it's canonical as well. Uh, and we're just going to run down them from number 10 to number 1. Now, as is usual, when I make lists like this, it's really only number 1 or 1, 2, and 3 that are 
ranked. The others are re just really great, but I'm not I'm not drawing a distinction between eight and six on a list like this, just so you know. And another problem that's going to crop up on this, as you're going to see, uh, is that some of the absolutely seminal, the great, the towering works of classic fantasy are series of books. And you can't recommend, it's not fair to recommend a series of books, but nevertheless, they are a series of books, and if you want the best experience, you'll read all of it. I had to deal with that here, and I'm, I'm uh, going to work my way around it a bit as best I can by giving you specific recommendations inside the series, just as a place to start. Uh, so that part is a starter kit. So I think I will call this a classic fantasy starter kit. And we're going to start with number 10, and number 10 is Farfin and Grey Mouser by Fritz Leiber. And those are characters. That is not that is not the title of a book. That those are characters. Farford and Grey Mouse are two freebooting swordsmen. They are uh, four higher mercenaries. They are best friends. And uh, the books in which they appear are amazing. They are amazing. Fritz Leiber wrote a lot of other stuff, like everybody else on this list. He was mind-bogglingly uh, prolific. But it, these are wonderful. And the place that I'm that I'm suggesting that you start is a story called Ill Met in Lankmar. It's not the first chronologically, but it's a good way into the Farford and Grey Mouser uh, universe, which you should definitely experience. Same thing with this next one. Number nine is Elric of Melnibone by Michael Moorcock, uh, uh, who you may know of, even if you haven't read the books, you may have heard of you know a, a, a sickly albino sorcerer who has a magic sword and who's fighting with his own kin in order to, to hold on to his throne. Uh, these are decadent weird fantasy stories in a way that only Michael Moorcock can do. And the one I'm choosing here is a book called Stealer of Souls, which is a collection of shorter pieces. Perfect for encountering this character and his world. Uh, and you will be hooked. If you encounter this character and his world, you will be hooked. Now, uh, when it comes to, to fantasy fans, uh, younger fantasy fans, fantasy fans who, who gained their sweet tooth in the 21st century, they may have heard of Farford and Grey Mouser, they will certainly have heard of Michael Moorcock, and may have heard of Elric, uh, but they probably won't have heard of my of my number eight, and that is Viraconium by M. John Harrison, who wrote uh, also a science fiction novel and has written some really good novels just comparatively recently, just in the last ten or fifteen years. Uh, Viraconium is a place; uh, it's a city. It's a dreaming pastel city late, late in time, late, late in the afternoon cultures when it may be Earth. It may once have been Earth. It may be Earth, our Earth, far in the future of Viraconium. The city is so old and has been through so many ages that it doesn't really even remember anymore. And neither does anybody else. Rippling curtains of reality can just shift across the city like snowdrifts. It's amazing. They are amazingly good. On this list, they are right up there for literary quality. They are, they are astonishing. And M. John Harrison wrote quite a bit in Viraconium. Uh, but the thing where I would ask you to begin is a, a novel called The Pastel City. He wrote short stories, and he wrote other novels. But the Pastel City would be the place to start with Viraconium, the way for you to get into that world. And you, again, you're going to want to stay. Uh, the next one, number seven, is huge. The whole of it is huge. Much like Viraconium, much like Elric, much like Farfetch and Grey Mouse, we put all these things together. It's gigantic. No publisher has done that, and publishers should, but that's okay. That's a rant for another day. The next one is the Mabinogion books, the Mabinogion Quartet by Evangeline Walton. Uh, and they are, there are four books, and they are big, sprawling epics, full of mythology. They are adapted from mythology, full of great characters, full of... Uh, I almost want to say Tolkien-esque uh, cod medieval dialogue and drama and whatnot, but the place to start would be The Island of the Mighty. If you can find that individual volume, that's a good place to start. Good luck. A publisher pre reprinted the whole of the Mabinogion Quartet about 20 years ago in an ugly and bad, cheap trade paperback. You might be able to find that. There, were also, there was a box set of the mass markets years before that. You might be able to find that. But as I mentioned, science fiction and fantasy eats their ancestors. They, they're poor to remembering their greats. So I'm not sure that you could walk into a bookstore and get the Mabinogion books, uh, but they're worth your time to find. Uh, then number six is The Last Unicorn by Peter Beagle. Uh, a slim work, a standalone work, so I don't need to give you any kind of introduction to it. 
and uh, a beautiful work, absolutely beautiful. Peter Beagle is largely forgotten by the, the broader reading public, but he's written a number of books. The Fine and Private Place is fantastic. The Last Unicorn is his masterpiece uh, and is well, well worth your time. It, it, for a few pages, it will seem to you to be the tweeest thing on earth. And then the heft starts working its way in. Just give it a little bit. Uh, then number five is Earthsea by Ursula Le Guin, which is, again, fairly sprawling by the time it's done. Now, the one thing I want to recommend that's in your bookstore is gigantic hardcover uh, collected books of Earthsea. A beautiful thing with illustrations by uh, Patrick Ness, I want to say, or I'm not sure of the artist, but uh, the, art, the illustrations are really good. And the, that volume is at your library, and that volume is also at your bookstore. It's not cheap. But at least I don't have to say that it's out of print. And Ursula Le Guin, without the illustrations, that, that Ursula Le Guin, these stories are in the Library of America. But for Earthsea, I want to recommend A Wizard of Earthsea. It's a very slim book. It's, uh, there are large parts of it, I would say, quite a bit of it, that is aimed at a child audience, or at least an all-ages audience. So it won't be hard reading for you. Uh, unlike our next one, <laughs> number four is Gormenghast by Merwin Peake. Uh, three books of weird epic fantasy that owe a lot more they are a lot more resonant with m john harrison with the viraconian books than they are with anything quasi pastoral uh and the place that you want to start is titus grown the first book but it's not the same as earthsea this is very very thick going uh it's brilliant absolutely brilliant but it's not it's not easy reading you have to be prepared to just sort of live with it for a while uh and then we get to our top three and number three is The Once and Future King by T.H. White, which is the greatest of all Arthurian pastiche stories. It's, it's, it's a, a retelling of the Arthurian legends of the Knights of the Round Table and Merlin and Guinevere and Lancelot. And it's like none of the others. It is harrowingly insightful and adult and beautifully, beautifully written. This was an author who could almost never write anything poorly, but here he's at the, the top of his game. It's just... And an amazing work. Uh, so it's number three. Number two is Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien, which is uh, was usually number one on most people's lists, and is certainly the work. It's the work. So if you if you don't have the time to knock off a list, a whole starter kit list, and you're wondering, well, what explains epic fantasy? What's a work that will give me the real gist of it? The Lord of the Rings will do that. The Lord of the Rings is the seminal work. Uh, but not, in my opinion, the best single work of epic fan of classic epic fantasy. For me, that would be The King of Elfland's Daughter by Lord Nudson, which is our number one. Uh, single standalone work. No reason to work your way in. The top three are all single standalone works, even though Lord of the Rings is often called a trilogy. Uh, the King of Elfland's Daughter, I think, is out of print. The, you can see right from this list the, the crapshoot of SFF immortality. You never know who's going to stick around and who's not. I'm very happy that that Earthsea volume is in bookstores, but ideally all of these things should be in bookstores in volumes every bit as ornate with original illustrations, and they're not. Tolkien is, sure. Once Your King will almost always have a volume in the bookstore, but Viraconium had a beautiful trade paperback reprint 25 years ago, <laughs> more than that, uh, and The King of Elfland's Daughter, I'm pretty sure, is not in print. Uh, but I showed you the cover of an old mass market paperback that I had once upon a time. There have been many others. I'm sure that you can find a copy. And, and once again, as with all starter kits and as with all my videos, if you can't find a copy or you don't think you can or you don't want to shop online, maybe you don't have any good bookstores anywhere nearby, feel free to let me know. Uh, either leave a comment on this video or email me at the, vid at the email that I leave below. Don't look at my personal Gmail email on every video and then think, hmm, I better look online to find out where I can email this guy. I'd rather not get emails from any other addresses, from places where I work or places where I edit. I leave you my own personal email. Send your requests to me there. Uh, but <laughs> that also is a tangent for another time. But if, as is always true with any of my videos, any of my starter kits, if one of these things really, really appeals to you, and you have no way to get it other than to put yourself at the mercy of the liars and charlatans on eBay, feel free to contact me. I can't promise miracles, but at least you have another set of eyes looking for it. Uh, so uh, that is my uh, classic fantasy starter kit. But these are also the 10 best things in this section of fantasy. So it's both a starter kit and a uh, uh, 
the Western canon of its kind. So these, I thought I would, I would post these here just so that you know where I stand on the subject as we continue with FFS. <laughs> I don't know what I'll do for subsequent videos. I suppose I'll talk about individual works. Uh, but I wanted to do some of these throat clearing videos first because they're just too much fun. And where am I going to get another chance? So I will try to remember to leave links to all of my co-hosts. You should go and subscribe to all of them because they're all going to be doing videos about fantasy. If you're interested in fantasy, you're going to want to give them all a watch. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.